Hello, welcome to the next A-level lesson from the conscientious biologist Ben Gallagher. This is the second one in the meiosis playlist. So this is meiosis 2, creating variation. It isn't the second division of meiosis. We covered all of meiosis, both divisions, the first and second in the previous video. This is just the second video about meiosis. And we're specifically looking at the little things that fit in the overall process that make each gamete very independent from each other, very different and can pr promote huge amounts of variation in the offspring. As always, please do subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't done so already, and do have a look on my Facebook and Instagram accounts for loads of additional information. Now, it is really important that you've watched the previous video first on the full process, but just to very quickly recap um, the process, this is the diagram that I gave you in the previous video of the entire process. So we're starting right the way over there um, in interphase. You've got G1, then you've got semi-conservative replication to turn the single chromosomes to double chromosomes. So then you've got G2. Those are all interphase. Then you can start meiosis properly and meiosis one, the first divisions. So we're starting on prophase one. Remember, really important in meiosis to make sure you put the one or the two after prophase, metaphase, anaphase, whatever. Otherwise, it will appear to be mitosis. If you just write anaphase, that means anaphase of mitosis. If it's meiosis, you must write anaphase one or anaphase two, depending on which ones of the divisions it's in. So prophase, remember, it's the same preparatory events in prophase one as prophase of mitosis, which is DNA condenses, supercoils. You've got the methylation and acetylation processes to condense the DNA. That makes it become visible. Nucleus breaks down to release those chromosomes. Centrioles migrate to the poles. But you've got this fourth key event in the prophase one of meiosis, which is that the double chromosomes find their homologous partners. So you create homologous pairs of double chromosomes. So those would contain four chromatids. Okay. And remember, the whole point of meiosis is to separate the four chromatids, which have the same genes in the same loca uh, locus position. You're separating those four out into different gametes. So each gamete has one set of those particular genes. And you do that for all 23 homologous pairs. Metaphase one, they move to the middle by the spindle fibers. Anaphase one, each homologous pair is broken into its double chromosomes and they get pulled to the opposite ends. Telophase one, repackage them, split into two cells. Each one of those two cells can then effectively just do mitosis to split the double chromosomes down into single chromosomes, which is what you've got going on here above me, to end up with the four cells. Those four cells are each haploid, containing only 23 single chromosomes, which is exactly half of what we started with at G1. So here's the full process. If you want another kind of summary from that, this is from the previous video, you've got it numerically. So you can see in humans exactly what type of chromosomes and what numbers are at each one of those stages. But the really important thing to remember is that meiosis creates four similar but non-identical haploid gametes. Similar but non-identical, meaning they have the same genes in the same positions on the same 23 chromosomes, but they could contain different alleles of those genes. So take a screenshot of this if you need it. This kind of has lots of summary information from the previous video. But what we're looking at in this one is some key events that happen here during prophase one, metaphase one and anaphase one that really promote high levels of variation. So the first and probably most important thing for promoting variation is crossover. Crossover allows you to switch some genes around or switch some alleles around. So what we've got here, if I put a homologous pair of chromosomes here, so these are homologous single chromosomes, single chromosomes wouldn't come together. It's only once they've done replication to form their double chromosomes that they would find each other during prophase one. But of course, it doesn't mean they're not still in pairs in the cell. Uh, that they have a matching partner. So these would be the single chromosomes. After S phase, you form the double chromosomes. And if you're looking at those double chromosomes, you've got sister chromatids within each double chromosome. They are identical because they were made kind of from the original single chromosome by semi-conservative replication, which we covered in a previous video. If you look at those two, though, the chromatids from different members of the pairs, then non-sister chromatids, they're similar because they will have the same genes in the same position or locus, but they could have different alleles. OK, now <clears throat> what I'm going to do, I'm just going to flip the one of them to green purely so we can see the difference between them. But they're still homologous pair. OK, now what can happen during crossover 
is literally the non-sister chromatids cross over they cross each other and the point at which they cross that i'm just marking in a in a red circle there is called a chiasma so you sometimes see another name for crossover is chiasma formation because that's the point at which they cross now it has to be very specific points it has to be at matching points so that the same quantity of dna is below the chiasma a good way to think about this and the way i demonstrate it in my classes is i get a pupil up next to me i try and pick a, a boy who's of at least vaguely similar size to me and they stand next to me and if you stand in a star shape with your arms up and your legs splayed you're in basically a double chromosome shape with your uh, left arm and leg forming one chromatid and your right arm and leg forming the other one and the, the pupil stands next to me there now, if we use our arms, so we're like upside down to this diagram, but if we cross over our arms, it has to be, a chiasma can only form at matching points. So if our arms are moving over each other's, if our wrists overlap, that's recognized as a matching point, that could form a chiasma. If our elbows overlap, that's a matching point. Whereas if it's my wrist on his elbow, they're not matching so a chiasma wouldn't form there so it has to be on matching bits to form a chiasma but if that chiasma can form the dna kind of locks together and twists around and switches over so what you get is this situation and this chromosome up here you can see now that the furthest chromatid from me is still entirely blue but the one next to it is no longer an identical sister chromatid because it's mostly blue but it's green on the bottom because it's exchanged that bit of DNA. So those alleles on that green bit may not match the alleles that are on the blue bit. You've effectively switched bits over. And the, chrome, the double chromosome nearer to me, you can see that one of them is almost entirely green, but with a bit of blue, and the other one's entirely green. So we've gone from only having two different types of chromatid on the first one to now having four different types of chromatid but it's actually a lot more than that in terms of the variation and the key variation here and this is what you must write in the exam crossover gives variation because it gives new combinations of alleles i'm going to try and make that more clear if you look over on the far side look if you've got gene q whatever gene q may be gene q at that locus on the chromosomes over there it might be the dominant version on the furthest one, so I put a capital Q. It might be the recessive version on the other one. It's still the same gene in the same position, so they're still similar, they're still homologous, but we've got different alleles of them, okay? Now, what you'd see, um, what you could have as well, on the lower bit of those chromosomes, maybe there's gene R, whatever gene R is. But on the furthest one now we've got recessive alleles on the furthest one we've got dominant alleles on the one slightly closer to me so you've got two genes and the combinations of alleles on the furthest one is the dominant q with the recessive r and the one slightly nearer to me the green one is the recessive q with the dominant r so those are your combinations of alleles the combination is dominant and recessive but the other way around on those things now look at what happens after crossover the Q's will still remain the same because they haven't crossed. But on the lower parts where you've exchanged some R's, you've still got on the outer chromatids, the original ones, they didn't cross. So you've still got the dominant Q with the recessive R and closer to me, the recessive Q with the dominant R. But now in the middle, because they've switched round, you've recombined on those two chromatids. You've now got two dominant alleles together. Well, you didn't have that before and you've got two recessive alleles together now you you may not be able to grab quite the significance of that yet so let's let me just try and break that down for you what we're talking about is a new combination of alleles is a new combination of proteins because alleles are genes that code for proteins proteins that have a function and if you've got two together they could work together in a biochemical pathway to produce a big advantage in a new variant they could be stages that work together to make that more clear I'm going to put a Z here. If this Z is representing some amazing biochemical that the body could make, maybe it's a new type of photoreceptive pigment in the eye that allows you to see a totally different wavelength of light and dramatically improve and increase your vision. Okay, Maybe it, it allows you to perceive infrared variants of light so you can see in the dark and you can see heat signatures like snakes can. Okay, That would be amazing. What a leap in evolution. And to make biochemical Q to make that, uh, that that photosensitive pigment you can make 
Z, sorry, you can make Z from chemical Y if you've got the recessive version of enzyme R. If we say R from up here goes for an enzyme, R will change Y into Z. Brilliant. Then you can see infrared light. You can see heat signatures. Amazing. But it's not that simple because Y isn't a naturally occurring biochemical either. You have to make Y from X. But to make uh, Y from X, you need the recessive version of enzyme Q. X you can just get in your diet. So let's say X is a biochemical and things that you can eat. OK, but to convert X into Y requires a recessive Q. To convert Y into Z requires the recessive Y, uh, the recessive R. And the only way you can have the two recessive ones together to complete that biochemical pathway is on the third chromatid here, where you've recombined to put the two recessive ones together. Now, obviously, it also depends what gets inherited from the other parent, because that one chromatid there, the recessive Q, recessive R, that would come from one parent. You'd need the other parent to also give recessive Q, recessive R to give you the, the full recessive genotype and phenotype. OK, but if you've got that and the only chance of having that is if you've got this crossover event from the original ones over there, which never combined the two recessive alleles. But what that would mean if that crossover event happened, giving a gamete with that third chromatid here, then there's a chance that the child that's born could make biochemical Z and could see infrared that no one else on the planet has ever had before. It could be a massive leap forward in evolution. So that's one of the reasons why this is such an important thing and why it can give so much variation. But there's a few little details that you need to know for why it gives actually such a massive um, range of variation. One is how long it can happen for. So crossover can begin as soon as homologous pairs form in prophase one. As soon as those two move next to each other, so form the homologous pair like on the far side, they can start doing this. And they can continue to do that right up until the homologues are separated at anaphase one. So throughout, you know, part, by midway through prophase, right the way through prometaphase and anaphase, right until they're split apart, they can be doing crossover. What you've also got to remember is it's not just one homologous pair in your cells, it's 23 homologous pairs in your cells. And crossover can happen on any number and any combination of those homologous pairs. So maybe just one of the 23 does it, or maybe five of the 23 does it, or three or 18 or whatever. It can be any number and in any combination. By any combination, let's keep it simple. Let's say crossover only happens on two of your 23 pairs. But is that pair one and two or one and three or one and four or one and five or two and eight or 16 and 19 or whatever? It can be massive variation. So any kind of combination of gene switching can go on, giving an almost infinite combination of not only chromatids that can be created within a homologous pair, but how those chromatids from different homologous pairs can impact on each other. And as well as that, within each homologous pair, they can do it any number of times. They can cross, cross a bit back, cross back again. Remember I said about the example of me and the pupil next to me, we could form chiasma at the wrist, swap hands, but then we could form another at the elbow. And so I'd effectively get my hand back, but a new bit of forearm. We could do it at the shoulder and switch then there. So I've now got different bits and whole new massive recombinations. So we can do it any number of times at any length of DNA. Between those four things, so any number, any combination, uh, any number of homologous pairs, any combination of homologous pairs, any number of times that crossover events can happen within a homologous pair and any length of DNA, that gives you an almost infinite re-scrambling of the alleles across all 23 homologous pairs. That gives vast amounts of variance, making millions and millions of different potential gametes from any one person. So this is absolutely huge. Take a screenshot of this because it almost always comes up in the exams. OK, second type of variation is something called independent assortment or independent segregation. They're kind of the same thing, just at slightly different stages of meiosis, but still within that original red box where I marked it on, on the first slide. So what we're talking about here, if I pull up again, homologous pairs, I've changed it just for visual contrast here. It just makes it a bit obvious when I shrink them down. I've changed it to a blue and a red in the homologous pair, and these are representing the paternal 
chromosome that you've got from your dad and your maternal chromosome from your mum. OK, so I've just changed the colour just to make it visually a bit more obvious. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to shrink those down to this size. I'll leave that up there as the key. But the blue is the paternal, the red is the ma maternal. And if I pull up a cell here, this cell being at metaphase one. Now, if I put that homologous pair in the middle here, it could orientate itself or assort itself that way round with the maternal chromosome, the red one on the top and the pattern one on the bottom so it can assort itself that way up or it could assort itself that way up with the pattern on the top and the matern on the bottom so that's where where this word assortment comes from is just which way around the homologous chromosome goes okay now why it's called independent assortment is because each homologous pair can sort itself independently of the others because just because that one has orientated itself that way doesn't mean that that one over there has to go the same way. I put it the same way just for a purpose that I'll show you in a minute. But that one over the far side can independently assort itself, paternal, maternal, whichever way up it wants. Same as the other one. Same as all of these. I'm just going to put five homologous pairs in there. But each one can independently assort which way round it goes, hence independent assortment of homologous pairs. Now, I've put all of mine independently assorted with the pattern at the top, the maternal at the bottom. There's a reason why I've done that, because I want you to imagine next what happens at anaphase when they separate from each other or segregate from each other. So this is why the independent segregation is just that each one of these can be pulled apart and separated independently of the others. So really what we're talking about, it's independent assortment at metaphase one, it's independent segregation at anaphase one, but they're both the same thing. It's about which way around uh, the paternal maternal chromosomes go in each homologous pair. But consider what happens next. If this happened and the way that I've independently assorted mine, I've got all the paternals at the top, all the maternals at the bottom. So when you follow that through to the end of meiosis one, so telophase here, getting your two new cells and you follow it all the way along to these four new cells, because all the paternal ones went up, they would have followed this upper path here. The maternal ones all went down, so they'd have followed this lower path. It means those two gametes over there would only contain paternal DNA, and these ones down here would only contain maternal DNA. Now, actually, if you think about it and combine this with the previous stuff we did on crossover, it probably won't be 100% maternal down here and paternal up there, because if there was any crossover in any of those, some of the paternal and maternal will have crossed over and switched. But for our purposes, let's just say those top two are almost entirely paternal. The bottom ones are almost entirely. But look back at the diagram. If the homologous pair closest to me, if that one independently assorted itself the other way up, so look, it's no different to the others. And what that would mean when you follow it through is that those have four to one ratio because they had four paternal chromosomes went up, but one maternal, and the ones down here are one to four. So we've changed the ratio of paternal to maternal DNA. If we change the other one, look, the, the second one in over there, then it would change the ratios up here to three to two and two to three. So purely by switching each one independently, we can alter the ratio of maternal to paternal DNA. So this is the really key thing about independent assortment and segregation. Uh, independent assortment at metaphase and segregation at anaphase, so, sorry, that should say metaphase one and, and anaphase one, serve to vary the ratio of maternal to paternal DNA. In other words, you're changing how much of your maternal paternal DNA gets passed on to your offspring. So take a screenshot of this, because this kind of explains it. But to really understand it, I'm going to show you how that works in a family tree diagram on the next slide. So if I put me at the bottom down there, OK, I contain 46 chromosomes I'm, I'm, and a bulk standard average human with 46 chromosomes in me. I got those chromosomes from my parents. So here's my mum and dad. Each of them have 46 chromosomes. Each of them gave me 23. OK, so I am and like all people, I'm 50 percent of each of my parents. Genetically, 23 from my mum, 23 from my dad. I'm half and half them. Now link this up to your genetics understanding. I might take more after my dad than my mum if the 23 my dad gave me 
were had more dominant alleles than the ones from my mum then my dad's alleles are more likely to be expressed than my mum's and I'll take more after my dad or the other way around and maybe I take more after my mum if she was the one who gave me the majority of dominant alleles but nonetheless when you look in my cells 50% of that genetic information came from my mum 50% from my dad so that's not going to change but what we're talking about with independent assortment and segregation is what my parents did when they did their own meiosis because when they were sorting out their dna their paternal and maternal is from their parents so whilst i am 50 50 of my parents i don't know what they passed me of their parents to make that more clear if i put their parents on here look. so here's my mum's parents my grandparents on uh, my maternal side they have 46 chromosomes each they gave 23 each to my mum so my mum is 50 50 them same on my dad's side they had 46 gave 23 each to my dad however the 23 that my mum gave me on the far side whilst they're 23 of her chromosomes and they are my maternal chromosomes she might have given me of her 23 her 23 might have been six from her dad and maybe 17 from her mum because those are her maternal paternal chromosomes so she gave me six of her paternals and 17 of her maternals that was the ratio that was put in the gamete that she made the egg that went on to become me so I'm ratio there six and 17 maybe my dad was a bit more of an even split and he gave me 10 from his dad and 13 from his mum but it's those ratios it's the ratio of your parents maternal and paternal that came to you that determined you as different to your siblings so in other words if you took those numbers you can see that I'm only 13 percent uh, taking after my maternal grandfather because I only got six of his chromosomes 37 percent my maternal grandmother 22 and 28 that's where the variation comes from with independent assortment and segregation it's a remixing of the next generation up okay so independent assortment and segregation reshuffles the contribution from each grandparent to create variation between siblings so when you do your meiosis to make your gametes you're reshuffling the ratio of your parents for what goes into your children so this is kind of talking about shuffling at a two generation level and it guarantees it. But from here you can head on to one about variation um, that just looks at the difference between genetic and environmental because obviously everything we've talked about so far has just been genetic influence on variation and the remixing of genetics in meiosis we need to also take into account the environmental impact Please do give this video a like if you find it useful. Do subscribe to my YouTube channel and remember there's loads of additional supplementary information on my Facebook and Instagram accounts. Thank you.